Welcome back to the podcast. I am Robert Cabral. I'm your host on K9 Conversations. I've got um, a really interesting show that I want to, a really interesting topic I want to talk about today. I don't have a guest, so it's just me and you. And um, we've got all the dogs in here. Dwayne's in the back sniffing. He's probably sniffing Goofy. You're probably going to hear Goofy snap at him in a second. And um, I, you know, I've been really listening a lot to people about this whole COVID thing. And everybody's talking about all the dogs they're rescuing and all the dogs they're um, you know, fostering and, and all these great things that are going on. The shelters are empty, this and that, because everybody wants to do something good, which is a really great thing. I really applaud people for wanting to do the right thing, clearing out the shelters and, and all this stuff. The problem's going to come into this. You know, this is one of the things that where, where people always think about the moment. It's an impulsive thing. And one thing that people always do when it comes to, to dogs is they think of that moment. That's why people go to pet stores and buy a dog, which is why I'm so against pet stores. They go on Craigslist and buy a dog. It's that instantaneous gratification that sets people and dogs up for in, incredible failure. And with, with the situation of, you know, of getting a dog, people overlook, sometimes totally unintentionally, the whole concept that a dog is a lifetime commitment, at least the lifetime of the dog. People don't realize, and, and often make this mistake, that they can't just dump a dog, but they do, right? They go to the shelter, they dump the dog, they give the dog to a friend. Oh, I can't take the dog. The dog's too big. The dog's too small. The dog barks. The dog farts or you know, does something crazy. And then the dog ends up suffering because the dog ends up being rehomed and rehomed and rehomed. There was a study I read um, not too long ago where it said the average pit bull has had six homes by the time it's, I think, two years old or three years old which is complete insanity. And this is one of the reasons why pit bulls languish and do such so bad in shelters because they lack socialization, they lack structure, they lack all these things. Um, the, 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 the idea that people are, are trying to do the right thing during this whole coronavirus thing and, and get these dogs and stuff and, and, and want to do the right thing and go to the shelter is very, very nice. And I, I applaud people for trying to do that. The problem is going to be when they go back to work. Right? They go back to their normal lives. Normal lives are going to start again. I mean, I don't know when, but let's say it's in a week, a month, or let's say it's even a year. At some point, that's going to start again. And then there's going to be a flush in the shelter of these dogs that people got out with the best intentions. They want to kind of rescue them. They want to do the right thing. They want to give them a great home. And now what's going to happen? They're going back to work. The dog gets left at home. The dog starts destroying the furniture, starts just peeing in the house, starts uh, chewing the wall, starts, um, you know, getting out, uh, rummaging through the neighborhood and all those things. Therein lies the rub. What I want to talk about today is something called separation anxiety. And separation anxiety is something that I've dealt with with personal dogs. My, my dog, Silly, my Sharpay had separation anxiety. It's something I've dealt with with clients' dogs. It's something I've dealt with in consulting with people. And it's something that's really really serious because it's a mental issue but it's a reality for the dog so in other words you know when somebody suffers with um you know some kind of an agoraphobia or, or a, a raphophobia, then they think hey quiet then they think that that's real, right? So to a person with arachnophobia, it, the, just the thought of the spider is crazy, right? They just, they, they, they obsess about it and it becomes a reality for them. So when a dog has separation anxiety, that crazy fear, that crazy um, phobia of being alone, of being separated from the person is something that is real in the dog's mind. So um, I talk a lot about it. Now, a lot of times do doctors, veterinarians will prescribe things like, um, uh, Prozac, uh, you know, sometimes they'll do something with THC and CBD to kind of relax the dog, but it doesn't make the separation go away. So I want to talk about it a little bit. First of all, um, the ASPCA says that separation anxiety is triggered when dogs become upset because of separation from their guardians, the people they're attached to. Escape attempts by dogs with separation anxiety are often extreme and can result in self-injury and household destruction, especially around exit points like windows and doors. So um, that's really a great definition that the ASPCA gave on separation anxiety. So let's talk about, first of all, um, you know, what is separation anxiety? And, and separation anxiety, you know, you can see it in anxious behaviors like pacing, whining, trembling, um, licking, like paw licking and, and all those things. Those are all symptoms or, or, or signs that a dog has this separation anxiety. They'll do things like excessive barking, um, howling, 
and they, um, because they're trying to draw attention, they're trying to find out where this person went, and through an action, a dog then um, is, is trying to elicit a response. So remember, dogs bark because one, they're adolescent wolves, they're very immature, they uh, bark for attention to alert something, or, uh, or because they're afraid. So um, when dogs become destructive, for example, like through, and this is something that they're now going to do because the barking isn't bringing their person back. It's not solving the problem for the dog. So a destructive act like chewing or digging, particularly around doors and windows, is real common. Often dogs will do things like self-mutilation. That's not in here. I'm kind of reading some of the stuff that I read on the internet, and I'm going to give you a lot of indications of stuff that I've seen in dogs um, that have separation anxiety as well. Um, they're mentioning accidents in the house, urinating and defecating. And that's another thing that a dog will do. First of all, they're not, they will do it to be defiant because they think it's going to get attention because probably somebody smacked them in the snout with the newspaper when they peed or pooed. But also, the more anxious a person gets, just like a person, um, then their, their body, their muscles become triggered and they become co constricted and then they'll have to pee because they're upset, their, their body is functioning in overdrive and that it will be a natural function of that. Um, excessive salivation, drooling, panting, desperate and prolonged attempts to escape confinement, potentially ending in serious injury. And dogs have done extremely serious and dangerous things through separation anxiety because they'll try to escape, they'll try to chew through a wall, they'll try to chew through a door, and if they're ingesting the paint, the, the, the wood chips, the, the plaster, and they will ingest that, then um, there will be serious injury as a result of that. And you have to understand that these things are going to happen, right? If a dog, if you get a dog at a shelter and they say, oh, this dog has severe separation anxiety, and then you're gonna step in and be the hero for this dog, you're setting yourself up to have to deal with these behaviors. You might ask yourself, who gets separation anxiety? Is there a specific kind of dog or, or um, a breed of dog that might get this? And the answer to that is any dog can get it. Generally, it will be more prevalent to a dog that's not as strong, not as, as um, uh, mentally sound as another dog, but any dog can be screwed up. And that's something that, you know, that we don't really address that much because we just think that you know we're trying to do the best thing and it can't be us, can't be us, but a lot of times it is us. So one thing, um, and my next point is, is, is it our fault? And it can be our fault, right? So in other words, what we tend to do when we get a puppy, we pay so much attention to the puppy or the new dog. The, this animal becomes then our life focus. For, so for the first whatever it is, week, two week, month, two months, three months, you know, everything's about the puppy. Oh, the puppy gets to go for a walk, or we play with the puppy, we hug the puppy, we kiss the puppy, we feed the puppy, we treat the puppy, we train the puppy, we do all this stuff. And the dog kind of gets used to that, right? It's kind of like if you go out on the first date, second date, third date, fourth date, fifth date, and each one of those dates you're bringing a dozen roses, on the seventh date you show up with a carnation, you're not gonna have a date. That's, that's a, a, a setup for failure. Whether it's with a person or a dog, it's the exact same thing. So it's good to cuddle the dog. It's good to give the dog attention and train the dog, just like it's good to be, uh, you know, uh, and this is my, my dating column goes on here. Um, you should set a good example. You should be early. You should, you know, brush your teeth, get the dirt out from under your nails, brush your hair, and, uh, and bring some flowers the first time. But um, if you then set this precedent for your date or the dog, whatever that is, that you're going to continue to do this you're just setting that precedent in the, in the creature's mind. So the dog will get so used to all this attention that it becomes very festered in the dog's mind. Now there are certain dogs, no matter how much attention you give them, how much you do that, when you walk away, they just have the, the, the constitution, the mental clarity and constitution to be okay with it. Like they don't really care. I, you know, I'm, I'm fine, I'm good, I want some time away from you, it's totally okay with me. But there are those dogs that become so attached to it, so hooked on that, so dialed into that, that it becomes a need. And it is a weak, it's a weakness in mental clarity or, or mental stability for a dog, just like it can be for a person. So if a person is triggered towards depression and then you say really mean things towards them, then they're gonna be depressed. I understand that, I have depression. So when somebody says something, I mean, most of the time I don't really care, but if somebody close to me does something to me like that, then it can really trigger me, it can really set me off. 
So if the dog has that mental weakness, and um, and again, a handicap, I've always talked about this, you know, I say a handicap is a weakness, and people say, oh, you're biased because it's not a weakness, but it is a weakness, right? If a person is handicapped, they're not as physically strong, they might be mentally even stronger than a, a physically sound person, but that is the hindrance. That's why it's called a handicap. When it's handicapped, it's a weakness. There's like a handicap in betting. Um, you, you get a better, um, better odds on the handicap bet. But um, so, so that is one of the things people will do to a dog or for a dog that sets them up for failure. They give them way too much time. And, and one of those things, you know, I, I talk about this all the time. I get more questions and phone consults on separation anxiety um, through crate training, right? That the crate of the dog is just barking. I had a, a, a lady the other day. Um, on a phone session and she has this husky and she said, well, the dog, and maybe you're listening, I don't know, um, but you know, the question was, the dog just whines and whines and whines and whines and whines in the, in the crate and when should I let them out? And the answer is when they stop whining, when they settle in. So one of those thoughts is, you know, first of all, having a puppy and putting him in a crate and giving him this clarity and all that stuff is such a wonderful thing to do for the dog because you're teaching them that being alone is actually okay. Right? Some people, there are certain people who can't be alone. There are certain people who just always want to be alone. You kind of want to find yourself in the middle, right? In the balance, in the middle. And with separation anxiety, it's triggered by animals or to, to animals that can't be alone, right? That, that when they're alone, they're obsessively looking for the person. They're, they're obsessively looking for something to do. So if they can't find the person, then they start to obsess. And if they're not used to being in a crate, then they'll start to chew through the crate, destroy their teeth. Um, they, they'll dig out of a crate. Sometimes dogs get strangulated when they're, if they have a collar on, it gets hooked in the crate or they get their, their neck jammed in a, a crate door and then they start to pull back and they strangulate and kill themselves. So that's not an uncommon thing. It's not extremely common, but for a very destructive dog, they can, ex they can hurt themselves more than I can even express here. There's so many different things you should check with a, with a veterinarian about some of these things. Like, um, Pull, knocking their teeth out by trying to chew through a crate, um, ripping up their whole skin and their, their neck by trying to climb out of the crate. Um, again, like I said, chewing, uh, jumping out of windows, um, any of these things. So we need to ask the question, what can we do to prevent separation anxiety from starting? And that is to give our dogs really solid structure. Um, if the dog already has separation anxiety, it's a lot worse. First of all, let's talk about um, preventing it, right? Preventing separation anxiety. And people sometimes don't understand, like, like people want to go to a gym and diet when they're already overweight. And that's, and again, I'm not making any slams on people for that, but um, you want to kind of get ahead of the curve. So you want to kind of look at yourself, like I look at myself and say, you know what, I'm, a, I'm getting, I'm getting flabby and I got to go to the gym. That's kind of my goal. Now you'll, you can ask Janet for the last month, I've been saying I'm getting flabby. I'm getting skinny fat and I want to go to the gym, but I can't go. Right? I can't do push-ups, hurts my shoulders. I, I need weight, I need w resistance training, and that's getting ahead of it. So I don't want to wait until you know, I look like, uh, you know, like a frumpy old dude, but I want to kind of get ahead of it. So with separation anxiety and teaching our dog structure, it's something we want to do early, early on. So any dog you have, no matter how young your dog is, how perfect your dog is, how you never ever had a dog that got separation anxiety, you never, your dog will never get separation anxiety or anything like that, no, none of that matters. You should do some preventative measures to keep your dog from potentially getting it because if they get it, it's a disaster. So a couple of things you can do. One is always crate train your dog, put the dog in a crate. And if you live in a, one of these nutty countries where your nutty politicians have turned um, against animals and done very cruel things to animals by not allowing crate training or corrective based training, then you know I, I, I urge you to vote um, and start petitions and, and get the help that animals need because not putting a dog in a crate is a super selfish, myopic, idiotic thing to do for the dog. It, it just doesn't work. It's a dumb, dumb, dumb thing. But giving them that structure in a crate letting them know that this is a safe place. This is a place you can just go and you can chill out. What it teaches the dog is I'm not going to do anything stupid, right? If a dog is laying on the floor and in front of the dog on the floor is a rug and the dog is bored and it's a puppy, it's going to chew the rug. Once that becomes a habit, 
this unnecessary chewing on something that they shouldn't be chewing on, once that becomes a habit, it's hard to break. It's like cracking your knuckles or biting your fingernails or anything like that. It's hard to undo these things. So what you want to do is you want to prevent the dog from forming the habit in the first place. Anything negative with the dog, you want to prevent it from happening. Dog aggression. You want to socialize the dog. You want to have the dog have positive experience because a negative experience is very hard to undo for dogs. And that's where a guy like me comes in because these people say, well, my dog got mauled by a dog and now he's aggressive towards dogs. What do I do? And the answer is you shouldn't have let him get mauled by the other dog because it's hard to undo it. I always used to equate it that when you, if you take a piece of clay and it's a fresh finished piece of clay and you put your thumbprint on it, that thumbprint is on it. No matter what you do, you can't get that thumbprint off unless you take something else and push it in further to eliminate that. And that pushing further is one of those things where you're going to have to set the dog up for success by not experiencing the thing that was negative to the dog in the first place. And that's a little harder to do than to just prevent it in the first place. So when a dog is, is set up for success, it means we teach it everything. So if we have a dog that's gonna be a protection dog, for example, then we wanna get this dog in front of people and we want a lot of people handling the dog. We want some rough handling with the dog, but we started out very slow, right? If you just take a, a, a three month old, four or five month old dog, and you start whacking it with a stick, the dogs, most dogs are gonna hate it and they're gonna be very aversive to it. So that if you then try to make it okay later, the initial, uh, preset in the dog's mind was very negative and he hated it. So now you've got to undo that. Better to start out with somebody he knows petting him with a stick, tapping him with a stick, giving him some treats, petting him with a stick, tapping him with a stick, and, um, and rewarding him, letting him play tug afterwards like that. Then the dog kind of thinks this is not a big deal. So with separation anxiety, to prevent it, we put a dog in a crate, we make the dog relax in a crate, we feed the dog in a crate, we give the dog treats in a crate. When they're in that crate, we just leave the room. Right? We don't talk to the dog, we don't say anything. And when the dog barks and howls and whines and does all that stuff, we don't show back up. Because if we show back up, we teach the dog that his action has gotten a response. As soon as a dog's action gets a response, the dog will mark that behavior. He'll understand what I did. I, X happened, I did Y, Z is the result. And when Y doesn't happen, when the result doesn't meet the action that the dog did, then the dog will try harder and harder and harder. The, and the harder the dog tries, the more the dog is set in the way that it must work. So what you're trying to get the dog to do, for example, with, with just the example of the crate, we put the dog in the crate, the dog whines, we leave, and the dog whines and whines and whines and whines, and it might be 10 minutes, it might be 30 minutes, it might be an hour and a half, right? It, it can't last much longer. When people say it's, it lasts three hours, well, that's because the dog has already been set up and learned and pushed past those levels. If a baby is screaming in a bassinet, and by the way, you put a baby in a bassinet, you don't just let a baby crawl around on the floor when you go outside to wash your car or, or do your nails or whatever you do when you leave the baby alone. You put the baby in a bassinet and the bassinet has sides on it, right? And because babies can't stand up, we don't have to put a lid on the bassinet for the baby. But if the baby could stand up, we want to put a zipper top on it or something like that. So in the crate situation, we wait for the dog to calm down, not to just simply one second stop screaming because then the dog will learn, I stop screaming and I start screaming again. The dog must completely surrender. And for it to surrender, it means it just has to lay down and just give up and accept the fact that nothing's gonna happen, right? And when nothing happens, then the dog realizes, okay, nothing happened, I can go through this, and then I get out. And when we take the dog out, we don't make a big deal out of it, right? We don't say, oh my God, you did so great, I'm so proud of you, you know, oh my God, are you okay? No, that's stupid, right? That's teaching the dog that good things happen when he comes out of the crate. We want the dog to realize that good things happen in the crate, throw treats in the crate, have a bone in the crate, have a Kong in the crate, have food in the crate, have whatever, right? Just make sure the crate is a good thing. Now, when you have a dog that you're just teaching to be alone, if the dog is fine to be in the house, I always set my dogs up, you know, and Amaya was one of the, the worst dogs on the planet because if I left her alone, she would destroy something. It was either a, a, a whole couch or it was maybe you know the leg of a chair or something like that. If something would for sure get destroyed. So for, it literally took me two years of having Maya um, in a crate when I would leave her or locked outside 
because I couldn't let her fail. If I did it for a week and then I let her inside, she would fail again. And the more of those successive failures the dog would experience, the more it would become an issue of undoing it later. So it could have lasted her whole lifetime. But because I didn't do that, because I let the dog learn the lesson of not succeeding in the negative, then the dog learned what I really wanted. So, you know, Maya would be outside. She couldn't destroy anything. There was nothing for her to destroy. It was her and Goofy and three marrow bones. So she had the time. She had something to do. And, you know, I would watch on my camera when I was gone. I would look and I would see, oh, look, there's Maya lying on the ground, just totally calm. She wasn't barking at the door. She wasn't pawing at the door. She just kind of surrendered to it. Once I saw that, I would leave her in the house and I would just leave for... I mean, literally, you know, five minutes, I would walk around my house and I would come back in. Then I would go run to the grocery store. I would check my mail. I would, um, you know, go have lunch or something like that. Never more than like an hour and a half or two hours. And I would come back, not make a big deal out of it all. I mean, I certainly would look around the house to see if she destroyed anything, but nothing was destroyed. So by these short uh, spurts of, of, of the dog being alone and then you showing back up, taught her that, hey, this isn't that bad. He's going to be right back. And then I built time and time and time and time and time on it. And that's how you build it. You build duration slowly with dogs. Anything you want to train a dog to do, you start in short duration. So if you want the dog to learn um, loose leash walking, you get two or three or four or five or 10 paces, and then you reward the dog for that. You release the dog. You let the dog do what they want to do. If you want the dog to do a bark on command, you go for one bark, two bark, three barks. At the end of the year, you have 300 barks. But if you're trying to get 10, 20, 30 barks, the dog will fail in the intermittent reward phase because it's not there. And that's the same thing with things like separation anxiety. I'll tell you, first of all, I don't, I'm not a veterinarian, so I can't advise you on it medically, but I don't really like drugging dogs in order to get them over things. I mean, there is an important time if a dog has severe separation anxiety and your veterinarian can work with you to put the dog on some kind of a, um, a mood calmer, like a, like a Prozac or something like that work with your veterinarian. Remember, you're going to, those doses start, the doses start out really low and they go up and then they modify. And when the dog comes off of it, the dog needs to come off of it very, very, very slow. If not, it makes the dog nuts, just like it makes people nuts when they start you know, wiping out school buses and, 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 um, and killing themselves. You don't want those mental triggers to be there for the dog. You want the dog to be able to have a really calm experience. And sometimes I've seen dogs that will go on to a Prozac They'll go through a behavior modification program and it's something that you can do. Um, it, it, you know, the, the things I'm advising you here for, from a behavioral standpoint really, really work. The more the dog is occupied, leaving a marrow bone for the dog, leaving a Kong for the dog. Remember, if you leave anything for the dog, make sure it's big enough where the dog can't swallow it. So a, a giant marrow bone, I always think, you know, the size of my fist, my dog's not gonna swallow that. With small dogs, I still opt for bigger bones. I don't leave tennis balls or any kind of balls that they can just swallow and ingest. Um, a really solid thick marrow bone, I don't slice them down the middle. I leave the bone whole and I cut the ends off. Gives the dog something to do. I mean, literally for a long time. You gotta be careful if you come home and it's on your bed, it's gonna look a little gross. But if the dog is just out chewing it, it's in the yard, it's something to keep the dog extremely occupied. You can play games with the dog. You can have Kongs hidden in the yard. You can um, leave some music on. You can have the TV on or radio on something to keep the dog occupied. Just think outside the box, but don't jump right away to drugs. Don't jump right away to getting rid of your dog. And that's really, um, in closing, what, what I want to talk about here is that the idea that that's going to happen, and I know we're going to be talking about it in whether, whenever they lift this ban, whenever people get back to normal, that these dogs are going to go somewhere. I mean, I mean, for sure, some will stay. I'm really great. I think I'm really pleased to think that a lot of people will keep their dogs. But I guarantee you, a lot of them are going to end up in the shelter, right? They're going to end up back. People are going to say, oh, I don't know what to do, you know, because the dog is with every, I mean, we're 24 7. I mean, I'm with Janet 24 7. I mean, that's it, right? I'm with my dogs 24 7. I mean, they haven't thrown me out yet because I'm a really good guy. I mean, I clean, I cook. I mean, I'm like, I'm Mr. Clean, Mr. Mom, Mr. Great husband, dog, dad, everything like that. And you should maybe do that. You should do that for your partner so that you won't get thrown out. But, your dog might get thrown out when this is all over, right? When you just get back to work and you see your dog's left alone and suddenly, 
what am I going to do? The dog's, you know, the dog's not getting four or five walks a day. The dog is not getting, you know, petted six hours while you're on on um, on the TV on the couch watching, you know, a, a Get Smart marathon or a Homeland marathon. What? is going to happen is the dog is now suddenly going to be left alone, left to their own devices, and you haven't done anything. So if you want to do something positive for your dog now to prepare the dog for this, and trust me, you should prepare your dog for this because you, you must go back to work. You must. You are not allowed to stay home that much longer. And when you go back to work, you want your dog set up for that. And to set your dog up for that, you're going to need to teach the dog to be alone. So don't take the dog on every walk that you go on. Don't take the dog every single time. Don't talk to the dog the entire day. Like right now, Goofy and Dwayne are sleeping behind me. I'm not talking to them, I'm not petting them, not, not, not giving them any attention, not training them, nothing. They have as much free time as they do have um, a, a attended time with me. And that's really critical. And I always do that with my dogs. Like when I first get puppies, I don't over baby puppies and oh, Gucci, Gucci, Gucci and fa fa fall all over them. I give them a lot of free time so that they learn that structure. And that's something you're going to want to do for your dog now before it's too late, before your dog does get you know get the, the reality check that you're not going to be there 24 7 you're not his uh 24 7 robot and if, if your dog gets that now dogs gonna have a lot easier time with it when this time comes and it's coming so what i want to do now is take a couple of questions um that have been emailed to me and sometimes these emails uh, you know they, they, i'm doing a lot of live chats to try to sort through these but um there is um they're they're insane see jimmy starts this jimmy sees somebody walking by and he doesn't dig it Right? So then, then um, he barks. Then, then Dwayne and Mater barks. And then Goofy barks. And I tell Goofy, Goofy, go lie down. Go. Go lie down. You don't want to tell him not to bark, but you don't want to encourage it. Right? It's really nice, like if you're a single woman, or if you're a husband, or a single husband, or a single uh, you know, guy, and you're afraid if somebody's going to break in, dogs are a great deterrent. Right? Let somebody hear a dog barking and know he's going to break in. Right? Nothing's going to break in. And you break in my house, you get a lot of dogs to deal with. you got me to deal with. Um, and I'm not going to bake you meringue. Not going to happen. So, all right. Anyway, here's some questions that I, that have been way, way, way um, left left here for a long time. Uh, Beb Hin Kilpatrick says, "Hello, thank you for all your advice so far. Recently adopted my dog. He's about nine to ten months old. By now, he's probably about a year or two old. Sorry, I just don't get to these that quick. Um, as a shelter, we're not was not 100 percent sure. We're just wondering about what crate do you recommend based on this situation? I've been living in Cambodia for about two years." and plan on going back home to Ireland in January. The dog has settled in great, but when it comes to the crate training, will I buy the airline approved crate, great size, but not as open as the ones you have for your dog? I feel because he will be going on the long haul flight soon, it would be best one. By now, he's already gone on the flight, so. Um, okay, it, it, it gets a long story. It's a long ask me anything, but I'm gonna tell you, first of all, crate training in the house, you always, always, always wanna use a wire crate. You don't wanna use the airline approved crates because what happens with the airline approved crates is they are too closed down, right? It's, it's for, for a dog that might be freaked out, it's not good. They don't like it, they can't see what's going on. The idea of a crate is for a dog to really be in a place and he can see and experience every single thing that's in the house, right? You want him to see things, smell things, um, everything but touch things. And by experiencing that, and he's only going to get that in a you know in a in a four side or five sided wire crate, um, it teaches the dog that oh I can see this, I can smell it, I can experience it, but I don't need to interact with it. I can kind of just stay here and watch it, right? It's just it's it's an observation thing. So always 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 go for the wire crate. If you're going to travel with the dog, then get yourself a nice heavy duty crate. Okay, next question goes out to J. It's just J, like the letter J, not even J-A-Y, just J, J, like K or L, but it's J. Thanks for your helpful videos. Robert, question for you. I just brought a one and a half year old American Staffordshire Terrier mix home as a rescue last week. She has excellent listening skills and is excelling in obedience training already. Her only major struggle is crating when I need to leave the house. She will whine and howl the whole time I'm gone. But how do you know she's whining and helping the whole time you're gone? If you're, if you're really gone, you don't know that. I've been gone up to two hours so far, and most worrying, she will ignore the chews and food I leave in her crate when I leave. I've always taken her for a long walk before creating and usually play tug or something before, uh, very active to wear her out before I go, and she will naturally nap outside of her crate after these activities as long as I'm home. But as soon as she knows I'm gone, she's a puppy alarm for all my neighbors. Well, that's probably how you know she's doing this. 
But as soon as she knows I'm gone, she's a puppy. Like, would you expect she'll naturally calm while I'm gone as she's home alone more often and we keep up on daily crate training? She's only been with me a week. Well, you're making a judgment way, way too early, right? You're not going to marry somebody after two dates. You can't tell me that the dog is, is, is doing this, that you're kind of settling into this. This is just a behavior she's showing right now. Can I incentivize her to keep her chews while I'm gone? Do I need to treat this like separation and isolation anxiety? Not to worry. You don't need to worry that much yet, right? First of all, I'm going to tell you, it's nice to let her out and go potty, but when you're saying to me you play tug with her and you wear her out and you do all these things before you leave, you're setting her up for failure, right? So you're giving her all the marbles. All the great, great, great things are happening when just before you're about to leave and then bam, you're gone right? That's not a good way to do it. What you need to do is take the dog outside, let him pee, let him poo, maybe walk him an hour or two before, get in the house. So the, the, the leaving should not be an event. It should be a non-event. And the way it's a non-event is if you don't make a big deal out of it. So before you leave, make sure she's gone potty, got in the yard. You don't need this long walk and all these step one, two, three, four, five things, because that's what's setting her up for the failure. That's what's making her think something's going to change, and that's something you don't want to do. So stop doing that and give her some time and let her whine through it. If you come back in the house and she's whining, don't open the crate door until she's calm. Just chill out. And whenever you come into your house, let the dog see, hey, he's back, but he's not opening the crate door. He's not excited to see me. He's not hugging me and kissing me and doing all that stuff. You know, that's not going to work. Next one goes out to Boots and Food, who says, Robert, thanks for the training videos. They've been really helpful with my three and a half month old German Shepherd pup. But my question is in regards to my older dog. In 2006, I adopted a four or five year old pup from a local shelter and a nine month old German Shepherd from a local breeder. I don't know too much about the history of the older dog. All I knew is she was returned to the same shelter three times as she was on the euthanasia list. Unfortunately, too many, she was considered unadoptable, so I took her in. I have successfully raised German Shepherds for years, but I could not break her, break through her numerous bad behaviors, including severe separation anxiety. So after years of training animal behaviors, three couches, a carpet, five concrates, and three doors later, she finally settled down until I lost my German Shepherd last December. Now she's exhibiting some older bad behaviors like chewing, peeing, and pooping in the house. I've taken her to the vet and she has no health issues. Any advice, by the way, I keep my current German Shepherd pup separate from her since she's too old to handle his playfulness. Well, first of all, kudos to you. I mean, you're a saint here. I mean, the fact that you went through couches and stuff like that and didn't put this dog down or return her to a shelter, um, you've got some cool character. You're a really good person, right? A better person than most people because most people give up on dogs when, you know, when they have one little issue. So. Um, you know, if she was really bonded to this other dog and that dog is suddenly gone, um, it could trigger her. It could trigger her to just be very sad, very depressed, very, uh, very low. And you might need to give her, you know, just a little bit more attention with you. You might need to give her a little bit more walks. You might need to give her a little bit, maybe don't feed her until you leave. Make you leaving something that's not so stressful on her because maybe she's triggering you leaving and the other puppy not being with her and you're probably doing the right thing, on, you know, in that uh, department. Maybe do things like, again, I was saying before, leave a TV on, have a friend or a neighbor go in and check on the dog a couple times during the day. Um, maybe even pay somebody a couple bucks to just go in and, and see her and do all those things. But, you know, she's an older dog. I mean, I don't know how old she is. I think you said to me before. But, you know, you've done so much with her. She's not going to regress that badly. She's just having a hard time since the other dog died. Sometimes that, depending how long they were together, it can last for, you know, a few months or even up to a year or so. So just be chill. Give yourself a huge pat on the back. You're doing amazing things. But, you know, getting somebody to check in on the dog would probably be what I would do so that she has something going on. This question goes out to don't touch my coffee. Thank you for all your videos. I have a 20-month-old pit bull mix. At what point do we stop saying months? Like, at, at what point do we say it's a year and a half old, right? Um, who's a shelter rescue that we rescued at 11 months old? At 11 months, I think that's the cutoff. I say, I, we say 11 months, and then we say it's a year old. And then it's a year until it's two, or a year and a half. That's it. Um, and that we rescued 11 months old, basically trained and is very well behaved. Here's the problem. She spent the majority, her short life in a shelter, next door to a city bus depot and has caused her major anxiety issues that I can't fix yet. She's well behaved and heals well normally, but, if, but I live near a bus line and the moment she hears a bus or any large truck, she immediately panics and pulls very hard to get to a safe place. She's got a high quality and properly fitted pinch collar, but would pull herself through it if she could. I can usually get her to sit 
under the noise uh, until the noise is gone, but she still wants to immediately go inside. Okay, so the prong collar sometimes will not be the best tool for a dog that's triggered by something because if she's pulling against it, then she's setting off a negative, right? So the reason the prong collar works is because when the prongs react, when the prongs do their pronging thing, then the dog is supposed to r respond to that if we taught the dog proper leash pressure and go away from that feeling. So if the, the prong is properly used, um, the minute the dog feels the pressure of the prong, the dog goes away from it and comes back into position or goes into goes against, um, goes to where you want them to go so that there's not that pressure against the prong. If a dog has an anxiety issue, the prong is oftentimes not the best thing. And I'm gonna go against a lot of trainers who use prongs to kind of beat the bad behavior out of a dog, but that's not what I use a prong for. If you watch my prong videos, I teach it um, for the dog to avoid it, and I can use it on a dog long term. I can put a prong call on a dog now, and Goofy's you know, on Goofy now, and he's wagging his tail, he's happy to go into it, because it means training, it means fun things are gonna happen. If it's taught in a negative way, it might not be the way to do it. So what I would probably do for your dog is I'd probably put her on a martingale collar and I would not feed this dog unless it was in the presence of a bus, right? I, I would get her out there when she's super hungry and I would just, I wouldn't f lure her through it. I wouldn't make her think that she's being rewarded for being anxious around the bus, but I would make a correlation that when this negative thing happens, more good things happen. The only way that's gonna work if the dog's really hungry. So I don't, I don't really know your living situation, but you said you live near a bus line. Um, but you need to get that to be more associative with something that the dog really likes. The other thing you can do too, um, you, know, you can play some pleasant music in your house, but you need to give the dog some time to get through it. So in other words, the dog just needs to get used to it. And, and maybe at the shelter, it was a really negative experience. The dog really hated it and the dog hated being in the shelter, obviously. So the dog um, has that negative association. Now, if you have the dog in your house, it's obviously not a negative association. So the dog will eventually overwash those negative behaviors with positive behaviors that are coming in your house because you're a good person and you're rescued a dog. Next question goes out to Trinador de Caes. I'm sure that means something in Spanish that I have no idea. Oh, Brazil. Okay, so that probably means something in Portuguese, which I should know because I'm half Portuguese, but I, I don't. Hey, I'm your fan from Brazil. Hey, I'm glad. Thank you for being from Brazil and being a fan. That means a lot to me. So I have adopted a seven-month-old Border Collie, but he's so scared and vigilant and anxiety. What do I do? I wanted him more balance. That's my dog, my dad used to talk. I wanted him more balance. That's, ex that's totally Portuguese. I, to I know exactly what you mean. So um, if you have a, a, bo a border collies can be kind of skittish, right? So that if the dog doesn't have good structure, it's a good thing for you, it's a seven month old dog, so you can kind of teach the dog structure. What I want you to do if you want the dog to have more balance is teach him a little trick, right? Teach him to spin right, teach, and by the way, that's in my member section, you can teach the dog that. Teach him to spin left, teach him to lie down, teach him to look at you, teach him to shake paws, teach him something. And I hate people who teach dogs to shake paws, but I'm gonna tell you, for your dog, it's gonna be okay. As long as you give the dog something to do, the dog will pull themselves out of the negative. So if the dog doesn't know what to do, and that's what's happening when a dog has anxiety issues, they don't know what to do, they're focused on the problem, you need to have them focus on a solution. And a solution is something you're gonna ask the dog to do. Sit down, shake your paw, uh, speak, uh, spin right, spin left, lie down, you know, back up, do whatever it is, and teach the dog that skill, and you're gonna change this dog's behavior quickly. And you'll be amazed, you know, and you'll be happy, and you'll continue to be a big fan from mine from Brazil. Okay, Damir Govind says, hi, quick question on the use of a prong collar. I am working with a dog that lunges at other dogs, birds, and even trees. That's called prey drive. The choke collar is pretty much useless, so I'm going to use a prong for, for him. My question is, how long does one typically use the collar for? I did see your video on fitting and using, but I just had this one question. So I don't know if your question is, how long do you use the collar for in a duration of the dog's life? Because it might be forever, and if it is, who cares, right? What's the difference? or if you're saying how long is the training for. But if the training, the training should be very, very short. The training should last no more than 10 minutes. Please, 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 please watch my video on pressure, leash pressure. Teach the dog proper leash pressure before you ever, ever use the prong collar. If you use it incorrectly, the dog is just gonna hate it and the dog can get worse. The prey drive can be initiated. So some people will use a prong collar to build prey drive and to work a dog through pressure and prey by using a prong. I don't suggest doing that for your situation in particular. Um, I would suggest that you teach this dog 
the escape path to the prong, and then you'll need to use very, very, I mean, when I use a prong on any dog I've trained, it's a very slight tap, hey, and the dog comes right back. It's a really clear communication, just like using an e-collar. It teaches the dog, this is the way out, this is what I need to do to escape that pressure, and it's a really, really fair tool. And like I said, you might be using it for some time with the dog, I don't know, and if you are, it's not a big deal, right? It's, it's just another tool, what's the difference if you put a prong collar on, or a, um, or a, a, just a regular slip lead or anything like that. Okay, Gene P says, I just found your videos and started watching, also subscribed. Thank you. Very interesting training tips, and Goofy is a special dog. Yes, he is. Thank you for recognizing that. We rescued a four-year-old AKC Belgian Mal about a year ago. He is our second Mal, but our first male dog ever. He has some issues that we have been working on, but he has one quirk that we haven't been able to remedy. Here we go. If he sees animals on TV, especially dogs, he charges the TV and just stands there barking. Obviously, Subaru commercials are his main nemesis. We are determined to work on this, but have only had measured success. Any suggestions would be appreciate, appreciated. So, real simple. Um, you can play my videos to your dog and see what he does. But what I would suggest you do for your dog here is teach the dog a solid place command. If it's a Belgian Malinois, he's going to understand this really simply. You teach him a place command, you turn the TV on for a minute, you, and if he gets off, the, you put him right back on his place. If he gets up and starts barking, hey, back to your place. You're giving him something to do, not telling him not to bark at the TV. Like if you say stop barking at the TV, that's confusing to the dog. What you want to teach the dog is go to your place. And when he goes to his place, then you turn the TV on. And you put something on, maybe get yourself a video, or maybe play some of my videos. And if the dog starts to break, well, hey, I said get on your place. When he gets on his place, lie down, put it on for a minute, maybe two minutes, that's it. Then turn it off and release the dog from the bed. Build duration slowly. That's what the dog needs. The dog needs to know what you want. And if the dog doesn't know what you want, he's gonna assume what you want, and it's usually wrong. He needs to know what is the right behavior. For example, Dwayne and Jimmy, or Dwayne mostly, got in this habit of licking the dishes when we put them in the dishwasher. Now, I thought it was really cute and real, real cute, and I did something stupid. I kind of let him do it. So I was like, oh, look at we got a pre-wash siphon on our dishwasher, and it was stupid. But it was funny, right? That, that's the important part. So now, when I open the dishwasher, he wants to lick the plates, and I don't want him to do it anymore because now it's not cute, right? This is a perfect example. So what I teach him now is lie down. So he can lay in front of the dishwasher and be hanging out with dad while dad's loading the dishwasher. And yes, Robert Cabral loads the dishwasher. And I know how to do it. I know how to stack it. And I, I like emptying it. I like drying the dishes extra when they come out. But he learned to lie down next to the dishwasher. And that's his job. So now he goes over, he lies down the dishwasher. If he gets up and licks something, I'm like, no, lie down. And that's the job. So that's what I do, right? It's, it's only going to be slow duration right now. And then you can build up from there. And the last question for this podcast is Mr. Skeptical, who says, how about one to two times a day for 30 minutes romp with two other dogs? He's 13 month old, three Mastiff breeds. He's the biggest. Also weekly walk of maybe a mile. I think he needs more exercise. The dog needs more structure. I don't know what you're talking about here, but um, a lot of romping with other dogs is cute, but you're going to build into this a dog that's going to become very, very doggy, and he's going to be really hooked on that. Build structure into your dog. Structure is the best friend of the dog. Structure is the best way to save a dog from ever having to go to a shelter. Structure is a good way to communicate with your dog and tell him what he can expect of you and what you need to expect of him. That's what you need to do. Structure is more important than exercise. I disagree with a lot of the trainers on the internet who say that, you know, I get the dog tired and the dog's easy to train. Well, of course, a tired dog is easy to train. It's like, you know, sleep deprivation is an easy way to get a person to confess to a crime they never committed. So. I believe in structure, good interaction, good solid training, and that builds your relationship. Your relationship is built through training, not through exercise. Forget that, that's not, that's not true at all. So use that as a tool. Anyway, that's gonna wrap up this podcast. It's just me rambling on for however long I've been rambling on for. I'm glad you put up with it. I appreciate you guys being here. I think it's a lot of fun. Thank you guys all. If you're a member of my membership section, we just redesigned the, in, the membership section inside. We've got, I mean, I don't even know, like 60 plus videos, like 20 plus almost 30 hours of video footage. Um, it's an amazing, amazing website. If you want to really take your dog training to the next level, robertcabral.com, check that out. Um, I hope you're subscribed to the podcast. If you're watching this on YouTube, hit the bell, hit the subscribe button. Uh, we're growing in, in record numbers. And you know why? 
it's because I'm the guy who tells you the truth. I'm not sugarcoating stuff. I'm not lying to you. I'm not telling you to use treats and stuff when they don't work. And I'm not telling you to use corrections when you should use treats. I'm telling you the truth. That's why I'm here. That's what makes me special because I tell the truth. And um, some people don't like it. And if they don't like it, that's fine. But, but uh, it's better to be loved for who you are than, uh, sorry, sorry, it's better to be hated for who you are than to be loved for who you're not. And I'm gonna end it on that. And I wish you a great week. See you next week. <laughs>